silicon posium spotlight webcast on patents, technology, and M&A. I'm Bob Schramm, Senior Vice President of the Quorum Group, leading an advisory firm for software and IT companies worldwide. We're the sponsor of WFS and are excited to bring you this IP Spotlight webcast, where we hope owners, executives, and investors in technology companies better understand the role that patents play in mergers and acquisitions. To do that, we're joined by two luminaries when it comes to software patents, from the entrepreneurial side as well as the legal standpoint. Casper is a longtime software entrepreneur and inventor, current vice president and director of research at Corm Group. Elon built, sold, and bought a number of software companies and holds 11 patents himself. In his current role, he advises entrepreneurs on a wide range of issues related to M&A and building relationships with buyers and has particular expertise on patent and IP issues. On the early side, Dave Lauer is a managing partner at LaVere, Grubman, and Payne, LLP, a full-service service intellectual property law firm. Dave long and distinguished career as both an engineer and an attorney, and is the past chair of the intellectual property section of the State Bar of California, among other titles. We are to have him join us today to discuss this important topic. We're going to both Dave and Elon today, and if you have any questions for either of them, I'd invite you to ask them in the Q&A window addressed to all panelists. We'll look for these questions toward the latter end or half of the webcast. To be good, I'd like to get back to Elon for a brief overview of the world of technology patents today, especially as they relate to exit and growth strategies. Elon? Thanks, Rob. Businesses have seen dramatic increases in need to consider intellectual property or IP in strategic decision making as they address issues of growth and exit. For rights, especially patents, are now recognized as cornerstones of business architecture. Technology patents in general have many commercial aspects from genes to patent roles, legal changes with the largest revision of U.S. legislation ever, and the business trade-offs driving vastly different chain strategies. Elon Musk, for example, recently abjured the entire Tesla portfolio, bringing their lobby display in, opening up dozens of patents in the electric car-related technical areas, in open source platform sort of play. Let's step away from specialty areas like that and focus on software patents, which better exemplify many of these issues as they relate to entrepreneurial practice, particularly in terms of tech M&A value. A lot has changed since I filed my first software patents, but studies confirmed in our forum practice as M&A advisors and educators. So funds are increasing. Most software firms still haven't been getting patents, with the possible exception of recent venture-backed startups. And, uh, when you consider that some of the companies that hold patents don't have a real business to go with it, the number of bubble companies generate revenue or garnering investment with patented technology is even lower. One that by tech innovation itself, patent value is hard to establish. Full investigation of claims and fit of the surrounding field is usually prohibitively expensive. So shortcuts to valuation have been sought. Academic study in the last decade pegged the average value of an individual patent during an M&A transaction a quarter million dollars, but also found other apparent trade-offs. There are also more arbitrary rules of thumb, like uh, assigning 25% of operating profits to the patent. Uh, PB of estimated license income, comps with similar patents, uh, costs. Uh, despite those attempts, there's no single monetary value that can be ascribed to each patent. Instead, companies must take into account a number of factors, such as the purpose of a portfolio, offensive, offensive breaking bill to a marketing objective, or inhibiting competitive funding, for instance. That also varies based on the extent of licensing, how much its validity has been tested, its expiration date. So the, the quantity of patents in a portfolio can be less important than the quality of those patents. And some seminal patents and each have enormous value on its own. Besides the total value doll, uh, uh, of a deal, the structure of a deal is important, and the presence or, or lack of a strong patent or patent portfolio can affect the acquisition terms, can 
identifications, escrow holdbacks, et cetera. Given these difficulties of determining value and the high potential costs, a really few large firms end up accounting for the bulk of software patents, with companies like Microsoft receiving thousands per year. Those big companies use these weapons in a astonishingly complex and expensive battle with huge stakes and implications for high-end M&A. Uh, for example, the wireless tech market collision among titans like Google, Microsoft, and Apple spawned a surge of high-profile patent deals a couple of years ago, with major total value going for less than a billion to nearly $20 billion a couple of years ago. The high-profile Nortel auction, where a group outbid Google's initial offer, accounted for billions in itself. Should a company hide under the table during a melee like this? Well, sellers know. One question we often get comes from companies who hold the patent that they think a larger company is infringing upon. Now, that should be, but it's not the way to lead into friendly M&A with the infringer. You don't tap the big guy on the shoulder and ask for your seat back while he's in a bar brawl like this. Better to point out the value such a patent can have to the acquirer's company on its own patent fight, or emphasize the value it provides to the successful business you are operating. So let's look at some such businesses. Surveying the recent landscape of liquid realization across markets that form traps. Since these services are generally not applicable, then circle back to some specific conclusions we often give as basic advice for the three main situations in growing companies find themselves at the threshold of exit. Same age for that, the current stage of the uh, public markets. U.S. and worldwide needs little review. Uh, I refer you to our, our last month's webinar and our, our, uh, for more emanation of the record-setting indices, interest rates, and deep corporate offers uh, that are full cash for M&A, right? This creates a great setup for sellers, and high-tech particularly, where our quorum index tracks the major indicators and other KPIs, including the billion-dollar-plus mega deals that are the backdrop for entrepreneurial-level tech M&A. Nearly all of the 2014 first-half mega deals involve patents, ranging from thousands of granted and applied for patents, and some of them down to what appears to be just a handful of pending patents and one of them. Surprisingly, that was the largest deal of all, WhatsApp, where the battle over claims will now be in the hands of a much larger and better funded legal staff, as with any patent litigation with related holders. A couple of suits are already underway from TriPlay and Intercarrier. The value here was clearly driven by the viral growth of uh, its user base, but it's always reassuring to at least be giving the lawyers something to work with. In this case, because at least one pending WhatsApp Patent, appears to have been filed before the law changed last year to first apply. Under the first to invent regimen, or may date back before the filing date. Hundreds of patents Facebook's bought lately from IBM and Microsoft may help also. It's all in line with another reason patent fights are difficult, even with great IP. Heavy weapons are useless in weak hands. Speaking of which, 2014 first half top acquirer Google's new subsidiary Nest had hundreds of printed patents involved, but perhaps I not have to be comfortable in the battles it faced, including a lawsuit from Honeywell. Its January acquisition for $3 billion apparently included a large portfolio of patents licensed last year as defensive weapons from patent arms dealer Nathan Mirabold's intellectual ventures represents a buy versus build trade-off, since the court patents can be faster than filing and prosecuting them, it usually takes two or three years, with about 10% going even longer. Now, we have a couple other mega deal patent tie-ins as we delve into some individual market segments of the six we track with 26 subsectors. The fastest is their aggregate performance, which has been showing similar numbers through several quarterly on course. Again, we'll be glad to send you a copy of our presentation on those uh, from last Turkey services sees little patent activity as a sector. This covers
cover the other five now with examples from this last year. Each segment has its own norms, from the domain intensive vertical markets to the intriguing little gems of gameplay and commerce mechanisms that give consumer software applications an edge. Just much of that commerce flows through the grandest consumer facing innovation of all, the internet, where we've seen overall values on a net climb through the first uh, uh, part of this 2014 and trading at healthy multiples, and which yielded a transaction involving a patent file nearly a decade ago. As Florida's destination rewards cashed in its coupons for a $20 million payday from Acquire Deluxe, a 100-year-old Minnesota firm. A patent addresses a system for providing a discount, and the method appears to include displaying side-by-side pricing to show the discount you'll get by spending virtual bucks instead of pay for money. Relatively deep roots of the patent, well for the digital currency craze, however well for holding up against prior art. Note that patent value can improve if it provides contact with opposition. Entrepreneurs will usually want to see the larger acquirer bear that risk and its costs, but argue to keep more upside in a transaction if the patent filing is older with less chance of precedent surfacing. Now, there has yielded robust multiples to the infrastructure sector, with sales and EBITDA up from, uh, up from the beginning of 2014. The world's leader in valuations is the fertilization sector, where innovation has a market breakout that's continuing to resist full consolidations. Tech improvements, made with patents involved, keep a, a boiling cauldron of activity underway in both software cycles and M&A. An example this year is 3D's acquisition of V3 systems provider GERT desktop virtualization appliances and appliance management software for about $10 million, mostly in stock. Uh, the deal, originally reported as an apparently fairly standard asset acquisition, including patents, was in a close with an apparently more complex structure that includes the right to acquire additional assets, including patents, with compensation subject to conditions. At Farm, we continue to emphasize the importance of structure in deals, and, and this applies to patents, too. Value is more important than headline number. That said, horizontal applications traditionally see the highest levels of value for retrenchment and fluctuations among the subsectors notwithstanding. The nature of patents and companies here tends toward practical improvements in architecture, particularly those that can be promoted in marketing to businesses because they increase a measurable advantage. An example is SAP's acquisition of KXEN, who patented Infinite Insight, a based platform, orders magnitude improvements in speed for customer lifecycle tasks. Companies can see value in acquisition with patents when extending age or entering related markets markets that enhance external credibility and internal confidence. Uh, we previously covered another example. Zebra's surprising purchase of Motorola Solutions patent rich enterprise business. Huge borrowed sum. More than Zebra's own market cap and how that reflects the low cost of cash supporting the M&A market. Uh, but it also appears to show additional value realized from the old Motorola's extensive portfolio of patents, giving Zebra cover as it spread out to a more horizontalized future, with an almost literal bet that the company got down from its rather vertical market origin. Speaking of which, rural market sector, over valuation multiples, gave back some ground last month, but they're stuck for the year. This space tends to be very receptive to patent value and its presentation sense. Those patents often include domain-specific matters, easy for acquirers to appreciate and less likely to be challenged from unexpected directions. Their subsector leads in this market, both in aspect and in valuations. For example, last month, GenStar Capital sale of Evolution 1 to WEA. Again, impinging on the digital currency flow trend, which is 
software for payment solutions that manage consumer-directed healthcare accounts, such as uh, our American Tax Advantage Individual Flex Plans, HSA. On the close education, we're in the second half of last year, Rosetta Stone paid $22 million in cash for classroom software company, Olexia, in a transaction that marks Rosetta Stone's first ever extension beyond language learning. Patented tech can help give a large company the confidence that it has freedom to operate and then assist in its marketing efforts and extending a brand. In this case, Rosetta gets Lexia's patented set without testing technique and helps it for positioning. And Rosetta takes the plunge deeper into the ed tech industry, setting up the plan for a children's education product offering addressing the burgeoning consumer market. That action is clear from the consumer market's phenomenal recent growth and valuation, with revenue multiples in particular finishing the first half up almost 60% year over year, uh, before some pullback last month. When the market raises how much it pays for top line that quickly, a course must chase growth. This played into a record first half in M&A activity, which takes us back to another mega deal this year. Poker Stars with its fast fold patent, which was first filed a few days before Christmas, nine years ago. The grant was published just this spring after a currently protracted negotiation over William Claims to a meeting with the U.S. Patent Examiner. That's several times the normal delay for such a patent. And today's meetings are, are unusual too, but MA and other negotiations. Sometimes that's the best way to close. And companies are also usually light on patents. In this case, though, the fast fold feature appears to represent a competitive UI edge in the cutthroat fast action poker market. Well, back to you. Thanks, Elon. Yeah, I noticed in many of these cases, an acquirer is entering a new market. Does patent want help with that? Hmm. Well, and my own advice, based on what we're seeing at Quorum and Context we just went over. Patents are taking an expanding role in small company If you have filings or granted patents, away, you may find them valuable at exit in many ways, including for acquiring entering new markets where they show evidence of freedom to operate and barrier to entry through computer deterrence, and give an acquirer comfort that their legal team has something to work with against competitor IP infringement claims. Uh, often, acquirer will. Uh, They'll see and admit value for cross-licensing or exclusive field of use licensing in auxiliary market applications of uh, uh, engine level, core tech, or, or instead of cash, it's a contribution to a joint venture. And the to call um, collective defense arrangements for space. Now, if you don't have filings or grants, but you do have new tech, particularly the core engine type that applies to many areas, um, um, I... I would consider at least a single provisional filing for reasons that I just mentioned. These take far less time and money than a full patent a provisional does, and will hold a place in line for a year while you proceed. There, uh, there, there's potential for rolling them forward after that that, uh, that, that I'll let Dave address. Now, that the, now with the U.S. law changed to first to file, uh, again, you can see our webinar about that back on the core site. Um, you're taking far more risk than years ago. Uh, you wouldn't buy a house without recording a deed uh, to leave education unprotected when sinking far more capital, sweat equity into a software company without the equivalent. Uh, it seems to be all too common to me. The high end, ultimate potential costs are certainly out of reach of many small companies. Uh, but a, a great deal of the value can be accessed with controlled costs, by starting with a single provisional patent. Another example of the provisional patent application is that uh, um, uh, is, is the advantage that lets you focus on the growth and exit preparation for your business while picking up the, the complex legal and technical aspects of a full patent campaign to to be dealt with by a partner or acquirer that has the resources 
they and the, the expertise needed to address them at the level they deserve. Thank you. Uh, terrific insight. Now, I welcome our next guest, Dave Laurevier, patent attorney and former chairman of the California Bar's Intellectual Property Section. Welcome to the program, Dave. Um, um, you set me up beautifully. Thanks very much. I'm here to address. I'm I'm here to address some of the uh, same topics you raised, but from a legal, more a little more technical legal perspective. To give a little bit of my background. ARM is headquartered in Monterey, California, and is in its 21st year with a worldwide intellectual property docket of patents, trademarks, and copyrights, as well as investment and litiga other litigation tech, uh, capability, offensively and defensively. I personally grew up professionally at Hewlett Packard Company, where I learned about the value of patents and how to use them in, gr in a growing company for both offensive and defensive purposes to achieve the business objectives of the company. I was with them in their early going where they considered themselves a startup for probably the first 40 years of their existence. I've also been a general counsel of a toy company where I learned the value of pa uh, trademarks, trade dress, and I use them as well. Let's begin by looking at intellectual property from a relatively high level. There are ways to define and protect intellectual property. In context here, where we're talking about software and, uh, and code and the like, it can be effective depending on its particular program, marketplace, and strategy. More on this later if time and, and questions permit. The right can also be used effectively in many cases involving software. I speak more on that later if there is interest, but suffice to say, copyright and protection are not mutually exclusive. Both forms of protection are available for software. The primary uh, methods for protecting intellectual property in our con context here is through trade sec secret protocols, patents. Probably both in some cases. Invents begin always as a trade secret. Somebody conceives the idea and wakes up at 1.30 in the morning and goes and tries it, and son of a gun, you may have an invention. But trade secrets are only good as long as they are kept secret. We should note here that a trade secret only has value if secret is kept in secret. I'm sorry, if the trade secret is kept secret in accordance with a structured protocol. There are some rules about this. I won't go into that detail here, but the structured protocol is key. If this protocol, the confidential, if the confidentiality is breached by somebody, legal protection is available only if you have a defined, with particularity, the parameters of the secret, and secret protocols are strictly enforced or observed. Third protection you'll want is a patent. Elon mentioned earlier, the recommended process begins with a provisional patent application. The document defines and describes and sets up a claim structure, structure for your technology in a non-provisional application to be filed later. They somewhat take the place of the old-fashioned notion of mailing to yourself your own say, trade secret or uh, keeping a lab notebook. Importantly, however, this particular approach holds your priority place in line at patent offices around the world, literally about 140, about 140 to 150, to 150 countries. countries. Your priority is of particular importance now in connection with the change in U.S. patent law from first to invent to first to file. That law was implemented as of March 16, 2000. Where the first for to file statutes no longer require that the application be filed by the app, the actual inventor. Let's say that again, anybody can file a provisional application or a non-provisional application, even if they're not the inventor. This is very important to note uh, as you examine what your patent strategy should be. Therefore, extremely important that the invention be kept, kept secret not talked about freely in public places like restaurants. 
if disclosed to a uh, third party, that disclosure should be covered by a formal confidential disclosure agreement. Many of you may call it a non-disclosure agreement. A provisional patent itself never, ever results in a patent. There's no such thing as a provisional patent. It does begin the process. It's also very helpful, incidentally, looping back to trade secrets, for defining your trade secret, because it outlines the basics of your technology, but is not made public okay, in the way a patent is or may be. You can license a provisional patent application and assign it like any other intellectual property right. By the way, it includes trade secrets. The provisional application holds your filing priority date uh, for a maximum, a maximum of one year. That time can never, ever be extended. Again, it's it from one year from the date you file and cannot be extended. Any world. Only extension, if we talk in terms of an extension, uh, is available uh, is available by filing a what I would call a less formal provision application. A little more on this a little later. Big advantage of the provisional application that can be done at much lower cost. I think Elon mentioned that earlier. And I think even more importantly, done much more quickly. In fact, provisional patent application can take almost any form. Uh, one such application several years ago includes several thousand lines of code put on Z fold printer paper. I don't even know if they make that kind of paper anymore. And shipped to the patent office in a box. There was a whole lot of disclosure, which will be key to any of the software to patent applications that are addressing here. Disclosure uh, in gray tail is key. Of course, we'd sim simply submit a CD uh, and, of course, less than Z-fold paper printout. Uh, the, the less formal provisional patent application I mentioned earlier can be filled maybe by converting, and I use that term in quotation marks, converting the provisional to non-provisional. But typically, you'll have to add claims because otherwise the examiner won't know what the uh, meets and bounds of your exemption are intended to be. For other technical reasons, we advise strongly against that kind of conversion, but there's simply, it is better to simply file a provisional application in the normal way, which includes an initial set of claims while keeping the, in order to keep the costs down, and which will be amended later, provide, which can provide the expanded scope of claims coverage uh, as a preferred strategy. Here it's important to say that the claims can be amended even be, uh, and should be, if you uh, use this approach, by, forming, by filing a preliminary amendment to the claims even before the examiner gets to examine it. In software applications, typically you can do that within about a year or so of the initial filing of the non-provisional. So you're not going to be incurring much cost at least two years, really, uh, after the filing of the provisional. That's the one year whole time for the provisional, plus about another year available of time to amend your cl claims uh, to a more formal strategy, uh, and by which time hopefully you'd have the funding to support those more formal claims. Let's uh, do three different situations you may find yourself in. Uh, as, a, as a startup or as a continuing operation uh, having software-based uh, technology. Uh, first scenario would be one where you, you don't have any patent or intellectual property protection in place. The one was where you may have one or more patents already filed but not granted. Third one is with a patent portfolio where you have a, already have a developing patent or portfolio of patent applications pending. I, uh, story one. If you don't currently have a patent, but you have patentable technology, as I, as Elon said before, we strongly encourage you to begin the process with a provisional patent application. Since the patent application is to be is confidential by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, even as against the Freedom of Information Act, also serves to define your trade secret. It, at least for that one year. Of as also mentioned earlier, copyright protect, protection is available for software code, as well as screenshots of user interfaces and the like. 
is fairly inexpensive. If you're concerned about location via p copyright of uh, like object code, for example, or even source code, there are ways to file what they call a non-publication copyright. I can, go, I can go into that later as time may permit, uh, but filing a copyright registration application does not, repeat not, assure that it will be always published. I mentioned earlier, if you have an application or SAS, uh, pardon me, an app, uh, or SAS already on the market, trade secret, or pardon me, trademark registration may also be desirable. If the patent application in process and budget pets, then keep the process going and try to establish three levels of claim strategies. The, th the three levels should include the broadest po possible claim, maybe some dependent claims extending from that, often referred to as a claim tree, and not easily allowable, but at least gives the idea of the scope you'd like to try and get uh, issued a in your patent. I refer to those oftentimes uh, as uh, the 30,000-foot level claim. The second level would be a mid-level set of claims where enough detail uh, is given to obtain an examiner's indication of allowable subject matter. It doesn't always work. It depends on the uh, experience of the uh, examiner, but sometimes you can get an idea from what he says uh, in his rejection of the claim uh, where you must go uh, to obtain allowance. This level is what I refer to as a picture claim. It essentially claims your block, your block diagram with all its hoary detail. Uh, by getting a picture claim out, you have the examiner's admission you've got a local subject matter. And you always go back in for broader coverage by way of amendments or other, which is uh, uh, technically, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, in the patent process and procedures. In addition, in addition, where possible and necessary, file an RCE or CIP to keep the opportunity to broaden and deepen claims live uh, coverage live during the M&A process. A, an RCE is a request for continuing examination. You've been finally rejected. You have no claims allowed. File an RCE to keep it alive. Or better, file a CIP. CIP refers to continuation in part where, in fact, you're adding some additional detail or new features which may, in fact, bring about an allowable patent. Finally, of course, if you already have an allowed but unshoot patent, depending on your specific situation, there are a number of different additional steps you may want to take to assure best protection and optimal value. Uh, by the way, if it's allowed but not issued, you may still want to keep it uh, pending Take the issued claims, but file a continuation patent in order to and add some additional claims or come back to claims you have deleted because it because it's shortened, the it's shortened the process. Trust such issued patents with applications on improvements, other embodiments, additional uses, and the like to build a patent portfolio which enlarges uh, the, the territory of uh, the, the line of patents that you're trying to build as a patent portfolio. That's enough for now, Rob. Back to you. That's a really valuable, important advice here. Let's get into the roundtable uh, portion of our discussion here. It's, uh, and, and I'd like to uh, you to your questions. And, and I'll begin with something that's been in the news recently. Even you alerted to this uh, earlier, but to a different Elon, Elon Musk and Tesla Motors, basically announcing enforcement on dozens of patents, open an opportunity for multiple companies to build out the infrastructure needed for a robust electric vehicle ecosystem. In a letter announcing this, Musk wrote that patents, quote, too often these days serve to stifle the progress and trust the positions of giant corporations and enrich those in the legal profession rather than the actual inventors. What are your thoughts on that, Dave? Are patents sometimes part of the problem? Here I think uh, Tesla is uh, very sensitive to making sure there's no, uh, how shall I say, 
uh, inhibit her to second sources. They're having trouble, or they're anticipating, I think very hopefully, that uh, they're going to have great demand for the cars. They need help in making sure that parts are available to them to build cars. But more than that, I think it has, uh, and, and of course, they don't have to license. If they've made it available anywhere, uh, you don't have to have a license. I was involved many ago with respect to Hewlett Packard's handshake on uh, fat machines, uh, the so called HPIB. HP gave away that technology. They wanted to sell fax machines. They didn't care about the technology. So this was a business objective. I think the business objective here is simply to make sure they can get product, don't get all fouled up with licenses. Better than that, on top of that, I think referring to some of the advice I may have mentioned earlier, namely, they afford to give these patents away because they probably have many more advanced techno uh, many more patents coming and in process on far more te uh, advanced technology on that battery. I know that there's a lot of work ongoing uh, at NASA and at Stanford on uh, incredible uh, technologies on long-lived grid power batteries. And for you, I believe Tesla is already looking forward many years down the line. Yeah, I, I agree completely. This is a special situation there at, at, at Tesla with the second sourcing. We don't see a lot of that happening in the uh, in the software field. And uh, uh, so, uh, and like I said in, in my opening remarks, it's also a matter of a uh, client in, in software might be uh, putting. Uh, putting some part of core technology or the uh, or, or uh, some innovative aspect of uh, API set uh, into the public domain uh, or or, uh, uh, or uh, licensing the the, the patents to that or just uh, uh, waiving them in order to uh, to keep the ecosystem growing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I don't think patents are obsolete because. Uh, <laughs> Because of the dramatic move, my name's Okay. Let's take a couple of questions here now from uh, our, our listeners. Uh, from Tim, if an invention has been in commercial use for a year, can you still patent it? This, that one's to you as well. Uh, the simple answer, no. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Uh, however, don't be completely discouraged. If the technology, if the bottom line technology has been in uh, in use and, and published and then sold for a year, you essentially blown your rights, except for any improvements or added features you may have had with a year of the time that you look at patenting it. In other words, if it's been ongoing for 14 months, but seven months ago you added a feature that was not uh, uh, that that, that is, could possibly add patentable uh, technology to the overall technology, then in fact it becomes patentable, but only secondarily. You've blown the rights on the 30,000 foot claim, but you might get the 1,000 foot claim on the feature you came up with seven months before. Yeah, and you might get 80% of the value of, 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 of it in an M&A situation just from having something on the improvement and so I'd advise everybody to even if even if the improvement seems small to you compared to the original breakthrough uh, it, it may be key to continued commercial exploitation especially by a larger entity that would want to partner with you or buy your company up to a particular channel of, uh, of market of market yeah, and of and of potential growth from there. So, uh, just because there's a several other ways to to do it, the um, there are ways are having some sort of patent pending, having at least a provisional pending, or better yet, you know, if it's going to be, uh, it may be a years down the line, or you may have a very fast response from people on something, uh, having that protection in place. Uh, gives comfort to the acquirer, and and uh, it's the old 80-20 rule. You, you could even it only seems like 20 percent as good as the original breakthrough you made the, the improvement they made on it. Uh, you get 80 percent 
of the of the value that we, you would be expecting anyway. So don't don't run it off because you're uh, in that uh, situation. Uh, take a good look at it, get counsel and uh, uh, and advice on the subject, and and uh, especially first file times. Now I would like to turn the turn it back on. I occur with that. Ronnie, you seem to have some questions coming in on the fly here. Uh, I'm seeing one about disclosures to VCs who refuse to sign NDAs. And maybe I should have mentioned this. Uh, during their due diligence, they simply will not uh, sign the uh, CDA. Let me point out something. You don't care if you have a patent application pending. Patent application is your protection against a V who's due diligence and won't sign an NDA. Okay. Yeah, and that applies in this, uh, and, and that applies in an M&A context as well. Um, okay. Okay, here's a question from Thomas. You may have covered this, but for most startups and even established software companies, cash is held very tight. So, a range of how much and how long to get a software patent max and most likely. Min max and most likely. That's very interesting. Okay. Um, Provisions at our firm run somewhere between uh, three four thousand dollars plus official fees, and the official fees are minimal in the hundreds. They keep varying, that's why I won't even quote them here. Looking at less five thousand dollars typically, of course, a little bit depends on what you have to disclose to to the firm or the patent attorney who does the work. If on uh, let's say a write up to track VC analysis. If you've got uh, good uh, implementation documentation, if you've used annotated code in some way, those are all good technical disclosures that a good patent attorney can use in preparing your provisional application, which will keep the cost down. The more you can provide, and over the way, the more drawings you can provide, the better. And by drawings, I'm referring to the old-fashioned flow diagrams or block diagrams. Very important principle to know. You can claim anything in the non-provisional patent application that you didn't disclose in a drawing. So the more drawings, the better. Non-provisional patent applications, probably another three to 5000 more like maybe more to $6,000 for the non-provisional. So at the by the time you filed the non-provisional and you're now underway, you've spent me as much as $10,000 total. And that probably can consider the possibility of an overall program having more than one feature that may have separate protection via separate patents that may clone themselves out of the parent, what we call a parent application. Now you've got about ten grand invested, but that's over a one-year period. Initially going in, it's less than five. Coming out at the non-provisional level, maybe about maybe the final claims, but it'll have a pretty good set of claims ready for examination. You've got the grand invested. Now, the rest of the process is de will be temp depending on how ex extensive the software program is. Large program where you need to polish the claims and extend them, uh, you know, ex expand them uh, to cover all features, you're going to look at another 10 grand or so. Play another year down the line to do it. Maybe you'll Software patents right now are killers in the Patent and Trademark Office. I happen to know about one that we are handling right now that we followed the non-provisional about a year ago. It ended up in a, a what they directorate or a group where they have it is in line behind 2,700 other applications that have not been assigned to an examiner yet. That particular group has only about 100 examiners. So you're looking at, uh, ex sorry, I said 100, uh, uh, about a dozen, about a dozen examiners. They're recruiting, but they're having a heck of a time finding examiners. They are probably a year to a year and a half away from having the non-provisional patent application assigned examiner. So you get years in many instances. The one I'm referring to happens to involve a very complex algorithm associated with music, but the end of it is that there's a lot of time between the non-provisional filing date and even the examination, let alone the issue date. So a lot of time 
uh, helpful to a startup or uh, 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 pardon me, uh, uh, an owner who wants to budget his budget the budget the time because budgeting can in fact uh, be over years, not months. And I, I just want to add there, if I may, Rob. Sure. Uh, the over over years can be in your favor. Again, having that provisional file is going to be a, a substantial part of the value in M and A or other growth in that exit uh, context. You you so much of the value, certainly the majority of the value uh, in most circumstances. By having the thing filed, and you get the personal file, the one-year delay before you have to file an actual patent, and then uh, you know Dave cited one particular uh, directorate's delays, but it, it, our uh, the average delays now are running in the years. So yeah, you've got multiple years here before you've got to apply any substantial uh, additional. Uh, uh, to, what you're, uh, uh, to what you're doing, and there's also opportunities to roll things forward in another provisional. So you have some uh, priority considerations there, but still you can keep sort of an uh, umbrella going uh, that you're that you're running under. And the um, and it just looks a lot different in an acquisition context than than being out there naked without anything on the patent side. Let me know. Go on. Uh, I was just going to mention one other thing, and that is that you you mentioned uh, uh, drawings, Dave. The, yes. Um, when, when, uh, when, when the attorney says drawings to you guys, it doesn't necessarily have to be in drawings, although they'll be reduced to that at some point, but that's years down the line. Those be screenshots. They can even be freeze frames on video of a code review like, Process where uh, where your engineers uh, go through explaining uh, the in, uh, the internals of, of your uh, uh, of your software, and that'd be a very efficient way to get a provisional on file without going through um, uh, in what sometimes turns into a perfectionistic uh, pursuit on the on the part of some teams. Point. In fact. One point, Elon, because we've used that many, many times. Two other issues to mention. One is, at the time you file a non-provisional, you're against the one-year grace period for another consideration, and that's foreign filing, for cor filing corresponding applications in other countries. That can become extremely expensive, by which time hopefully you'd have a VC uh, or somebody, somebody other... other some other person available to help fund that one, if in fact foreign protection is uh, important. Uh, second thing has to do with the uh, importance of uh, not uh, counting the fact that the patent hasn't been allowed yet or issued. A pending patent application can be very valuable to an M&A uh, situation because that gives the acquiring entity the opportunity define the claims they want to during the prosecution process. In other words, if they see the opportunity they particularly want to protect, they can help tune or refine the claims so that it is directed to channel my channel that they are interested in. So it's not a big disadvantage to have a simply a application pending. Uh, the fact that the patent hasn't issued yet may frankly be very valuable, and that was also the reason why I mentioned keep alive if you already got them on file, because the the acquiring entity may very well want to tune the claims they want to the, for their their objectives. Yeah, maybe in a better position to do that with more resources to study and and devote to them, and and uh, and more budget to uh, uh, to be able to address their their drafting. Exactly right. Yeah. So here's another question that relates to the acquiring entity, in this case in the cross-border context. A uh, company is based in Europe and aims to be acquired by a U.S. company. The question is, what will be the recommendation for software protection, as my knowledge in Europe will not be able to protect it? No? Well, the protection in Europe is more limited. On the other hand, uh, 
at the at the same time, everybody agrees that at least currently, the market for most software products is still emanating uh, out of the U.S. Uh, so I'm not sure that, that the limitations of European protection are, are are controlling here. You still have to have the U.S. market protected to the extent uh, to, uh, to the greatest extent possible. Not, not quite sure what the uh, what the point of the uh, I, I'm trying to uh, penetrate the point of the question here. I, and just in in case, I, I would just come out and say that uh, you, you don't be a U.S. resident in order to file a U.S. patent, right, Dave? Yeah, right. And that's that's what the concern. You're you're right about. I'm answering the question a little more generally, but uh, it it uh, there there are limitations. But on the other hand. And uh, I attended a, a conference uh, about a year ago, and there are changes happening. Uh, interestingly, at the uh, at the at the international level, uh, not the international. Well, call it international. At the European level, as opposed to uh, uh, there's the community of the European countries, uh, and those changes are ongoing. Uh, they're not all implemented, and they're still uh, trying to decide what they want to do. The nationalistic, uh, the, the nationalism kicks in a lot, but on the other hand, they're trying to make themselves look a little more friendly to uh, technolo technological advances in uh, in the European community. Yeah, and we'd be happy to, uh, I'd be happy to uh, take a call and discuss that one in more detail for a specific, because a lot by country in particular. Oh, good. Here's a question from Ed uh, in relation to software patents. Could you discuss the various aspects? That is, there are underlying algorithms slash code, but there's also the manner in which the algorithms are executed. And then there's the output user interface. Does patent need to cover that? Well, the user interface is key in my experience. Uh, we have something resulting from the algorithm. Uh, typically, the display of of something, the original patent uh, uh, went to the Supreme Court to do with technology for vulcanizing a tire. It was a very simple program. This was many, many years ago. The algorithm essentially monitored the temperature during the process of vulcanizing a tire. And when it hit the right temperature, the vulcanizing system was shut down and the tire was removed from the mold. Uh, it was eventually held that just because a, uh, a process includes software does not make that process untenable. I believe strongly that is still currently the law, and it was a long, long time ago, and I won't admit how long ago I know about it. <laughs> the next is, again, just because a technology includes computer software, it does not uh, prevent uh, it from becoming patentable. And uh, that's still the principle, even in the face of the Alice, Alice uh, recent holding in the Alice case. Right. Speaking of which, uh, here's a, there's a question from Nico that relates to that. Can you please discuss the patent value impact for small software companies from the Supreme Court decision of Alice Corp versus CLS Bank? Well, I looked at the case, not in the detail that I probably should have uh, to answer this question in, in as precisely as, as everybody would like. Uh, I believe, frankly, through some of the media, that that case has been overblown to mean the wrong thing. My feeling is that the case stands more for the fact that a, a business method is not patentable, and it has nothing to do with the patentability of software. It's far more... Uh, uh, directed to business methods rather than the particular program involved. And let, let me point out a little more about that. The LS, uh, uh, application involves a supposedly a computer program that helps control escrows. Well, escrows have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, where a third party holds your money until everybody performs. This is not new. This is nowhere near rocket science. If they had disclosed enough of the algorithm, and I'll come back to that in a minute, in enough of the detail, they might have gotten a claim that would have, uh, up, that would have been would have withstood the scrutiny the courts took on it. I don't think they gave enough detail of the program. 
and program was probably not all that uh, uh, involved to begin with. My patent software, or I strategize a patent a strategy with uh, with clients. I point out that you got to get into the detail of the program itself. Oftentimes, my mid-level or or picture claim that I mentioned earlier in this presentation will involve actually claiming the algorithm itself, the the actual uh, rendering of the algorithm. That kind of detail is what they're looking for to sustain the software. In this case, in the Alice case, all they're doing is an escrow, and I don't think they disclosed enough. I think they had more of a disclosure problem under 35 U.S.C. 112 than they had any kind of a problem with the, uh, the basic premise uh, that the software is patentable. So, yeah, I, I've got to agree with that, David. It's, uh, you know, uh, go on. It's not the end of the end of the world at all. And I, I think it, this was a bluff out of proportion by, by some folks that managed that uh, the case gave greater clarity to the software patent situation, or even constricted it uh, as a way to uh, work against the patent troll problems out there. Uh, but I don't, I don't see the impact at anywhere near the levels that uh, some folks have. I think we're uh, uh, blip. And, and we've run about 10 minutes long. We really appreciated the discussion. Great material, guys. All your questions, too. If we, if we weren't able to answer them here, we'll reach out by email and make sure that you've gotten them answered. I want to thank everyone for attending, and in particular Dave and Elon for sharing their experience. We have ordered this session, and it will be available uh, on, on WFS.com. So tune in for... Uh, a, a rebroadcast or, or uh, the availability of this webcast on that site. So that's everybody. Thanks so much.